praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah in the language of saint paul the letter written to romans he says through one man sin came into the world and because of sin death spread to everyone that man was adam and now the new adam that is jesus through his obedience the power to conquer death and sin has come into the world the path of salvation is now open to everyone so through this person called jesus the world has got the power to conquer sin and death in our lives now there comes a question very specially in this easter season if jesus has given us victory over sin and death over all kinds of evil things then why are we seeing evil being perpetrated yet why are we seeing sinful things being carried out in the world if jesus has given us victory then why all such things are happening we know that all around the world are so many sinful things being done sometimes we think the world has become more sinful than it was the wicked things have increased like never before that's what often the impression we get corruption has increased there are all kinds of powers of evil that is that is roaming around there is the power of anger bitterness we know that there are people who are not talking to each other for many years there are communities that are at war at with each other there are nations that are getting ready to have war with each other so we know the power of hatred the power of anger and revenge so much explicit in the world even in our own families we are able to experience the power of anger and bitterness the power of lust we know so many sexual perversions being carried out so many unfortunate news that we come to listen the power of greed for the sake of money people killing stealing and robbing people who have lost all kinds of consciousness so how do we interpret this or how do we understand this if jesus has given us victory if he through his death and resurrection has given us victory over sin and death then how to see all these things all these events taking place in the world let me respond to that question with a story of how we conquered a deadly sickness called smallpox when we learn about this sickness called smallpox we understand some 10000 years ago it is it is being found out some 10000 years ago this sickness was seen in the world it began in some northeastern part of africa and then it spread all over the world this sickness or this virus spreads through air and it affects the skin cells it affects the spleen the lymph nodes it affects the bone marrow it is said that 30% of people the very second week they die of this sickness that was the chaos and confusion that the sickness was creating in the world people were having no answer to this sickness people were dying billions of people have died that's what the study reveals billions of people have died because of this sickness now how did we conquer this sickness this is a man called edward jenner edward jenner who came into the picture with his invention he invented a vaccine to fight against this sickness he invented that medicine in the year 1796 1796 he invented this vaccine 
That means we got the medicine in the year 1796. It was successfully experimented. We had the power to conquer this sickness. But it's only in the year 1976, that means almost 200 years later, that the World Health Organization declared that we have eradicated smallpox. But again, the estimates tell us that in 20th century alone, 20th century alone, that means from 1900 to 2000, 300 to 500 million people have died because of this sickness. Now, I take this story as a kind of parable or an analogy to understand how we conquered the power of the sickness. We had got the medicine. In 1796, we had got the medicine. And yet, people were dying of the same sickness. Even when World Health Organization declared that the sickness has been eradicated, still people were dying. The 19th, in the 20th century alone, some millions of people have died because of this sickness. Now we know what happened actually. It was not enough that the medicine has come into the world. People had to use the medicine. They have to open themselves up to this vaccine. Only then they would get the power to have victory over the sickness. In the same way, my dear brothers and sisters, what has happened through the resurrection of Jesus is this. Humankind has got the power to conquer sin in their personal life. The question is this. Have we opened ourselves to the power and the glory of this victory? If we have opened ourselves to this power, to this glory, to this victory, then definitely we would experience that in our life in a very explicit way. We know we are people who are struggling with many of our personal sins. We have decided many times not to get angry anymore or not to harbor bitterness against anyone anymore. We want to talk to others. We want to get reconciled to others. We don't want to have the power of envy in our heart, but we are jealous. We are gossiping. We are speaking about people at their back. Many such things that we are doing. The sexual perversions in our life. Many times we have decided not to go into those activities, but again and again we are going into those activities. The sins of thoughts or actions or our words or omissions, we are not able to control ourselves. If we are not able to experience this power of the Lord in an explicit way, then this is what we understand. We have not yet opened our lives to this power that has come into the world. We read from the book of Acts, a very beautiful incident that the church is bringing before us. It's about Peter and John who healed a crippled beggar. Now after they heal the crippled beggar, they are being brought to the council and they are being questioned. And the very first sentence that we heard is this, chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed. A very explicit transformation has taken place in the life of Peter. We know what happened before the death or resurrection of Jesus. The same Peter denied Jesus because he was afraid, was full of fear. And therefore he denied the Lord three times. Even when the Lord had told him that you would deny him, it was there in his mind. And yet he denied because so much was the fear which was dominating his mind. Now the word of the Lord says, after the resurrection... After receiving the power of resurrection, the same Peter has become so bold, so courageous, that people are amazed. Even being uneducated, even being illiterate, how they are able to quote the scripture, how are they able to speak with so much of force, they were amazed totally. The work or the power of Jesus is at work. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
My dear brothers and sisters, I want to talk about this courage that one gets when he or she opens to the power of resurrection. We become courageous. We become bold. We are not talking about a value, a secular value. We are talking about courage and boldness in terms of Jesus Christ. This is what the command Jesus gave to his disciples. We read Gospel of St. Mark chapter 16. And he said to them, Go into the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. This is the mandate the disciples are receiving from Jesus, from the resurrected Jesus. You have to go to the world and you have to proclaim the good news. Good news, again, is not some stories, some good stories or some good moral values. Bible is not talking about that. When Bible says good news, it means crucified Jesus. That's what St. Paul says. The gospel that I'm proclaiming to you is crucified Jesus. It is not some stories or the wisdom of the world. I'm not talking to you about that. For that, there are so many places. We know in the world today, there are so many places where we can go and listen about some moral values or some conferences, some meetings, some stories. But when we are turning to the church, we are coming to listen about the crucified Lord. This is the mission that Jesus is giving to his disciples, to the church. Go and proclaim about the crucified Lord. And for that, we need a lot of courage and boldness. It's not an easy task. To speak to the world about Jesus, we need courage, we need boldness, which we are seeing in the life of Peter. Now, what is courage, according to Bible? Or what is this fortitude, the gift of the Holy Spirit? The gift of fortitude or the gift of courage is, I'm fearless in times of hostility. Now what I'm doing right now does not need any courage. What I'm doing right now does not need any boldness. Because I'm speaking to a crowd who wants to listen about the Lord. You have all come here willing, willingly to listen about Jesus. To speak to such a crowd, no one needs any courage or boldness. But to speak to a crowd that does not want to listen about Jesus, that is indifferent, or someone who is, who is hating or who does not want to know about the Lord, to speak, about, to speak to such people, we need courage and boldness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, for example, we hear about the martyrs. The martyrs who shed their blood for the sake of Jesus. Who even did not regard their life as important when it comes to the matter of Jesus. So, in the first century, in the Roman Empire, so many Christians were martyred. They lost their life for the sake of Jesus. In a hostile world, they were holding on to who Jesus is and what Jesus is. They did not compromise. In a hostile world, they did not compromise with the teachings about Jesus. They kept on saying that Jesus is the one God. They're living in a time when the emperor has to be worshipped. The emperor is God. But they very plainly opposed it. They said, it's Jesus who is the only God. And for that, they had to lose their life. Now, we are living in a world, or we are living in a country, where we don't have to lose our life for practicing Christianity. Or for following Jesus. We are living in a free country. We can practice any religion. And therefore, maybe we don't have to suffer in that same way as martyrs suffered. But even today, when we are living in such a favorable situation, we need courage and boldness to go after Jesus. Without courage and boldness, we cannot proclaim the message that Jesus wants us to proclaim. For we know that if we decide to radically follow Jesus, 
if we are deciding to radically follow Jesus, then we will have to come out of our comfort zones. That's very clear. We'll have to lose many of our conveniences. We'll have to lose many of our comforts if we decide to follow Jesus 100%. It's easy to follow Jesus maybe in a 50-50 way or in a 90% or 10% way. But the moment we decide to follow Jesus 100%, then it becomes extremely difficult. For example, in our workplace or the business that we are doing, I've heard many people saying this. Father, it's not possible to do business and then to follow Jesus 100%. Because in my business, it is, it is understood that I have to resort to many such practices that are corrupt. So it's not impossible to follow Jesus and also to do the business. So some kind of compromise is needed somewhere. Many of us go with that kind of perspective. Some kind of adjustments can be done. And therefore, we are not disturbed. We prefer to have that comfort zone, and so we don't find following Christ a challenging thing. To follow Christ needs a lot of courage and boldness. Maybe for the sake of Jesus, I may have to lose my job. Or maybe I will lose the source of income because the income that I am getting is because of a corrupt thing that I am doing. If I am really following Jesus, if He is the first one in my life, then I will definitely say no to those things that the Lord does not like. If I have submitted my entire life at the feet of the Lord, then I cannot continue to walk on the ways of sin. That's what St. Paul is teaching us. How can you continue to be in sinful ways even after accepting the Lord? It's impossible. That means I have not opened my life to that power or to that glory of the Lord. There are many things in my life that are more important than Lord. It could be money. And therefore, in order to get that money, I compromise with the teachings of the Lord. Or maybe it could be my name or my reputation. So, for example, if I speak about Jesus, others might think that I am a fundamentalist. Or others might label me as an extremist. I don't want that label. And therefore, I keep quiet. I want to be known as a broad-minded person. I want to be known as an open-minded person. And therefore, I talk about all gods in the same way. In order to have that name, in order to have that reputation, I compromise with my faith. Or for example, if I speak to this person, maybe this person will not like, and he or she will go away from me. My beloved or my friend. So for fear of not losing my friend, or for fear of not losing this relationship, I keep my mouth shut. I don't speak about the Lord. That's what we are saying. Even in this world, in order to follow Jesus radically, we need that courage. And that courage and boldness comes when we entirely open our lives to His power. Or maybe we know that there are people around us who love to talk about others. People who gossip. Or people who crack dirty jokes. It could be in our workplace, it could be in our neighborhood, it could be in our relations. So how do I face such situations? Do I just keep quiet? And with that, I just try to brush off that thing. Or in that time, do I stand and say what you are saying does not match or does not go with the words of the Lord? Do I have that power and strength? Do I have that boldness to say or to speak in the, in the person of Jesus. I keep quiet or maybe I ignore, I, I go away from that place because that person is more important to me. I want to be in the good books of that person. And therefore, I don't say anything that he does not like or she does not like. Remember what Jesus says. If you love anyone more than me, you are not worthy of me. 
That's where we are seeing. We are saying that to follow Jesus needs a lot of courage and strength. But often in the world today, we are trying to domesticate our faith. We are trying to reduce the feast of Easter, maybe, to some good moral values. But this feast is something greater than that. This feast is asking, asking us the question, have we opened our life to the resurrected Lord? Are we experiencing His power in our life? I remember a testimony or an experience that was shared by a mother. She came for the retreat and she came and she shared her experience. She said her daughter was diagnosed with cancer. And the cancer was in the uterus, in the primary stages. So when she went to the doctor, they were abroad. They were living in some European country. When they went to the doctor, the doctor said, You see, you have the sickness in uterus and the uterus has to be taken out or has to be removed. So the doctor advised this girl, this young girl, maybe just 22 years old. The doctor advised, if you have the desire to have baby, you go and have a relationship with your boyfriend, get, your, get the baby and then we will remove the uterus. This is the advice the doctor gave. And when she heard, a very young girl, when she heard that, she said, I can't do that. And the doctor was amazed. Why? Don't you want a child or a kid in your life? She said, of course I want. Then what's the problem? So she said, what you are saying is something against my faith. The doctor was amazed. The doctor was, was surprised and he asked, where are you coming from? What is your faith? And she said, I'm a Catholic. And I have been raised with a Catholic teaching. And according to Catholic faith, this is a sin. She was bold enough to say that. And then she left that place. She left that place. She came for the retreat. She requested the prayers. She went back. And the mother said, this girl who had this sickness, cancer in the uterus, she did not go and do what, what the doctor advised. Well, that was the advice of science given to this young girl. But she held on to the Lord. She opened herself to the power of the Lord. And what happened? She received that healing touch. She was healed totally of that cancer. She got married, she conceived, and now she's the mother of a child. That's what happened. She was bold enough to receive the power of the Lord. Just as Peter. We are living in that world. Now we know that our world is becoming more and more secular. And when you stand for faith, you are going to be mocked at. You are going to be humiliated. You're going to be asked, where are you coming from? From which planet you are coming from? This is all something ordinary that is happening here. Contraception is not a sin. Or IVF is not a sin. Or homosexuality is not a sin. These are the messages that we listen now, more and more. So when you stand for faith, you are standing against a trend. And to stand against the current needs a lot of courage and strength. To go with the current, to go with the flow is an easy thing. To say what the world is saying does not need courage. But to be the voice of Christ in this world, we need a lot of boldness. Which comes only when we open ourselves to the power of Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A great saint, St. Thomas Aquinas great doctor of the Catholic Church, he once said, if the highest aim of a captain is to preserve his ship, then he would keep that ship in the port forever. 
if the highest aim of a captain is to preserve his ship, then he would always keep the ship in the port forever. My dear brothers and sisters, what St. Thomas Aquinas is teaching is this. The mission of a Christian, the highest aim of a Christian is not safety. If we are looking for safety, then we can never practice Christianity. If we always want to be in our comfort levels, then we can never practice Christianity. The ship has been made to go into the sea. It is there where the ship faces storms. It is in the sea that the, the ship faces huge winds or great winds, the turbulent waters or the rough sea. It has to go to the sea and there it has to come across all such things. Safety is not the highest aim of the ship. It's not with that purpose that ship is being made. It's being made to go into the sea. Same way St. Thomas teaches us. The mission of a Christian is not to just a safe life or to play down safe. That's not the motto of a Christian. The motto of the Christian is to follow Jesus. And when we radically follow Jesus, there's going to be difficulties. There are going to be challenges. There are going to be storms. And we're going to hit rough patches. We heard what happened when Peter, when Peter and John gave the reply, the council members. They ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. What is happening? The council members have come to know that a miracle has happened. They are witnessing that. They are approving that. A crippled beggar has been healed. They are not denying the miracle. They are approving it. But instead of believing in the one who, with whose name that miracle has been performed, they are trying, they are trying to stop that from spreading. That's what the world in which we are living even today. There are so many people, so many people who don't want to believe in the Lord or in the power of God. And so what happens? When we go with faith, we are going to be made fun of. We are going to be discouraged. What is our attitude at that time? This has been from the beginning. It's not that today we are going to have those people, even in the time of the apostles, even in the time of Jesus, such people were there who see the things and yet don't believe. In the time of Jesus, we know he is performing a great miracle. He is he's raising Lazarus. He's bringing the dead man out of the tomb. And the word of the Lord says, Many people believed in him, but some others, they went and they plotted against him. Because their argument is this, If we allow him to go like this, many more people will follow him. So let us kill him. They are approving the miracle of Jesus, but they don't want to believe in Jesus. Same is happening with the apostles. The council members have seen the miracle, but they don't want to believe. They want to stop that news from spreading. Even today, you go out into the world, you speak about the Lord, you speak about His power, people will not believe. You will come across such people. But the word of the Lord says, let us not be discouraged. Let's not be disappointed. Let's continue to do our duty. Our duty has been given by the resurrected Lord. Go into the world and speak about the crucified Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.